All right, CNFers, before we get started, a special call out to journalists and nonfiction writers who could use some extra support in these unpredictable times. Writers House Pittsburgh is accepting applications for a six month residency starting as early as January 2021. The Writers House is a physical home and long term residency seeking to provide housing stability, mentorship, and community when you need it most. I don't know why I'm reading this so aggressive, but maybe I just like it a lot. Head over to writershousepittsburgh.org to learn more. Applications will close on November 30th. That's like in two weeks. Get on it, man. I just follow my curiosity and, and think, oh, that looks interesting. I wonder how that works. I wonder how that came to be. I wonder how, uh, what are the stories behind this stuff? That's Kermit Pattison, CNFers, right? Well, maybe, maybe you know, maybe you didn't. I'm Brendan O'Mara. Maybe you know, maybe you didn't. Hey, hey. And this is the Creative Nonfiction Podcast. Huh. I just love when that distortion kicks in. I mean, I can't hear it right now because that goes in in post, but I know it's there. I know you're banging that head of yours. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is the show where I talk to badass people about the art and craft of telling true stories. You're going to want to keep that conversation going on the social media networks at CNFPod and head over to brendanomero.com for show notes and to subscribe to the monthly CNF and newsletter. If you're on the list, You'll get reading recommendations, podcast news, you'll be entered into book raffles, that's pretty rad, and you automatically get a ticket to the CNFN monthly happy hour. We had a fun little cohort the last time, and I'd love to see it continue. Newsletter is the first of the month, no spam, can't beat it. You know, also, you know, reviews for the show or social proof for the wayward cnf -er. Reviews on Apple Podcasts help a great deal. I don't think it makes the show get any more visible. But if the, like I said, the wayward cnf -er is coming by, I'm like, oh, that show's got like a lot. I'll check that out. Right? That's the social proof aspect of it. Um, but if you don't want to do that, you could always email me one, creative nonfiction podcast at gmail.com, not gmail.com. And uh, I'll read it on the air and I can use it in promotional material. So there's ways you can contribute if going through the whole Apple thing is a bit overwhelming or frustrating. Because, you know, Apple, Apple can be frustrating. All right, enough of that, enough of that housekeeping. Kermit Pattison is here. He's the author of Fossil Men, The Quest for the Oldest Skeleton in the Origins of Humankind. It's published by William Morrow. It's a sprawling tale of the arty skeleton. R-D-A-R-D-I. And then it's like, I think arty pithecus. Anyway, I'll spare you the pithecus. It's about paleoanthropology and the toxic rivalries among scientists. It's got all the goods, man. It's a dense topic that Kermit de-denses. He de-densifies it. It's a word. Look it up. Don't look it up. You have that to look forward to as well as my parting riff. At the end of the show, I'll warn you with this. There was an odd kind of ratchety click sound that was coming off of Kermit's audio. It's not that annoying. It only crops up from time to time, so be forewarned. I'm sorry for that. Maybe the wire of his headset was rubbing against something. I don't know. I need to get better about like when I hear weird shit like that to just be like, oh, let's uh, let's uh, I'm hearing something weird coming off of you. Let's uh, let's hit pause and uh, you know, try to fix it. Because of course, you might be listening and be like, yo, what are you, some? Some Bush League, some Bush League podcaster, get out of here. Also, I am back. I'm back in the fray. After my hall pass of editing me out of last week's show with Annie Duke, I figure I need to be there as like a river guide might uh, 
you know, need to be in the raft going down the uh, Colorado River. Uh, Pete Croato, who's uh, who's written this great book called uh, From Hang Time to Prime Time about the NBA. He's going to be on the show in December. Uh, he came on the show four years ago, and he's got this book out. Um, he and I had a nice uh, exchange over Twitter DMs about the topic, and uh, he convinced me that I should still be in the show. So I might even republish that episode with my buttery voice and uh, be done with this infidelity, if you will, of skipping out on my show to go somewhere else. Baby, I can change. Will you, will you take me back? Oh, boy. Here's Kermit. Riff. Uh, yeah, I guess that goes back pretty young with me. Um, so, uh, I mean, I, I, there was a couple episodes in school, elementary school, that I can point to uh, when a teacher said, oh, you were good at this, or you're good at telling stories. Maybe you should be a writer someday. Maybe they said that to everybody, but uh, <laughs> it, it did sort of plant a seed in me. And then uh, one time, I guess the real closest thing to a formative experience was probably when I was in ninth grade and I got this electric typewriter. And uh, this is the age before computers, right? So Mm -hmm. back in those days, like the image of a writer was someone like clacking away, you know, on the old, the old, uh, you know, manual typewriter. But I got an electric typewriter. This was thrilling. So I just set myself up in my room and just started typing things because of the novelty of this machine. You know, you could sit there and type away and something would come out, you know, even with my really bad typing skills would come out looking, you know, like almost professional. So I, I would write stories. I would write, you know, parodies, you know, fake news stories, um, short stories, poems. And, you know, by the end of ninth grade, I had like this pile of things that uh, I called the Gonzo Papers. Like one of, one, <laughs> one of the things that I was really into in those days was the Hunter S. Thompson, you know, Fear, Loathing, Las, Las Vegas. So at this you know, shameless emulation, I called this thing the Gonzo Papers. Um, so at different points in life, it's occurred to me maybe to do something else, uh, but never. So the temptation has never been so great that I've actually done something else. Yeah. What, what were, or what did those temptations look like as you're a, a potential escape hatch? If you yeah. Know? Well, uh, I thought for a while in college of maybe being an academic, uh, probably would have been history or something close to that. Uh, so that was one, the, you know, like a lot of people in journalism, you know, the temptation of law school, uh, always sort of loomed as a you know an escape like a parachute you know you put that on and and uh, you know jump out the journalism plane and and <laughs> you know hopefully have a better salary and more secure life so that was another uh, at different points I've taken on writing jobs but things that were more um, you know corporate writing jobs things I did just to earn a living. Uh, and I've done that, you know, a number of times over the years. You know, I haven't been tempted by any of those things for quite a while. So what continued to be the draw to journalism and in, in this kind of reporting and true storytelling? Um, it's just a matter of wanting to work on things that mattered to me. Um, when, I mean, to me, the most frustrating jobs have been or I felt like I was doing something pointless, like something that was just throwing coal into some furnace that didn't really do any good to the world or was just going through the motions of something um, for no particular purpose. And I've had, you know, frankly, some journalism jobs that have fallen into that category and I, you know, and I did not like them. Um, but, you know, so the thing that, that just always has been my guide star has just been work on problems that matter and things that are interesting 
and things that keep you engaged. Find a way to create some added value, either by uncovering something no one has seen before or telling it in a better way or uh, something, you know, to add something new to the story. And you mentioned Hunter Thompson, of course, uh, a <laughs> moment ago. Um, aside from, from him, who are some of those North Star writers who you looked up to and you're like, oh, man, maybe I can do what they're doing? Yeah, well, okay. He has not remained, you know, a, a guide star. He was the the person who who is kind of like the bad boy rock star figure who appealed to the thirteen year old me in the black t shirts who, uh, you know, kind of just got over Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison, then moved to Hunter S. Thompson. So, so, but but you know, he he. I remember reading that book and thinking it was just such an absurd premise of these guys, you know, going to these you know, conventions of law enforcement officers or what was it like? And, uh, uh, and interacting with them, uh, it just seemed like so ludicrous, uh, and fun. So, um, that one, that, that book grabbed me just cause it made journalism and writing look so much more, uh, fun than anything I had encountered in, in school up until that point. Um, so uh, so who would the others be? Uh, well, that was one. Certainly when I got older, the Woodward, Bernstein, All the President's Men, I read that when I was, I think, between high school and college. And it's, um, it, it's not a... Um, you wouldn't call it literature by anything. I mean, it's kind of a page-turner. It was probably written on deadline. But it's such a great and momentous story about a true detective story of these two reporters. So that was my first window into the life of a reporter. Uh, And uh, so that one captured my imagination. Later, Tom Wolfe. I don't don't know if you remember this, but in like the 1980s, right around the time that he was writing Bonfire of the Vanities, he was writing at least one or maybe more than one manifestos of what what journalism could be. And I remember him talking about how, you know, too many writers were just breathing the same stale air and needed to get out and mm-hmm. do what, what Dickens did, you know, is to report on their time. So that, that struck a chord in me uh, and made journalism seem like something was worth doing. And it was, uh, could be a vocation where you reported on things in a, in a deep way uh, where you were writing more of, not just about like the events, a series of events, but opening a, a window into a time. And that, that certainly intrigued me. And I, I, I love to, at the very start of the acknowledgements, you write that nobody in their right mind takes on a project like this. <laughs> <laughs> My only excuse for starting is that I was naive. Yeah. My only explanation for finishing is that I had a lot of help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had a lot of help. I mean, the help is just, it, it's what your, what your sources do. Uh, I mean, and there were, you know, hundreds of those people, but, you know, uh, you know, years of just asking questions. Well, what does this mean? What does that mean? What does it, you know, what, what does bone look like when the first time you saw it? I mean, on and on and on like that. So that's that's one. Um, you know, all the people that listen to me talk about all this stuff. Uh, so, yeah, the, certainly this this it would be a difficult book to write. Well, for me, it would have been impossible to write in without that help. Um, and over the course of your your career as uh, as a reporter and in, in writing features, you know what in what was embedded in your you know training over the years that gave you the assuredness and confidence that you could tackle a subject as big and uh, and sprawling in the best possible way as Fossil Men was. Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't really have much training to be honest with you. I mean, my training is mostly self taught. Uh, you know, I majored in history, so I didn't have a journalism background. I mean, I did a little work for the student paper, uh, but not much. And then when I graduated from college, I thought, okay, well, I'd like to be a, a writer. I, I knew I wanted to write books someday, but, you know, you don't come out at 22 and say, okay, I'm going to write, you know, Fossil Man or whatever. You, you, mm-hmm. you know, the kind of conventional path was you go work for a small paper somewhere. You make your mistakes. You know, you'd learn all learn about interviewing, et cetera, et cetera, covering the local school board or the, you know, a bait, bait district or, or whatever. So I, 
uh, sent letters all around the country to Oregon, to Washington, to California, to Florida, to New England, to the Midwest, uh, to all these papers, and uh, and you know, saying hi, you know, I'm so and so, I'd like to come work for you, and you know, put in the clips and. And by the way, this is back before the internet, right? So to like mm -hmm. contact all these people, I had to call them up, uh, you know, say hello. Who's your managing editor? Can I speak to that person? And then a lot of those phone calls don't go anywhere. They'll say, "Ha ha, we haven't hired anyone in years," or "We're in a big recession," um, or whatever. But anyway, I found a couple uh, places to apply to, and anyway, I wound up at this little paper in Key West, Florida. I don't know if you know Key West, but it's this bizarre place down at the end of US-1. You just follow US-1 south and it just dead ends into Key West and it's this bizarre place which is uh, a small island that's packed full of tourists and southern bubbas and it's a gay mecca and it's a military town and it's full of uh, Cuban exiles and uh, <laughs> all simmering in the heat. It's also, actually, oddly enough, sort of a... a known as a writer's mecca too, like Ernest Hemingway had a house there and Tennessee Williams lived there. And there's a whole long list of people who wound up in, in Key West. So anyway, I wound up working for this little paper there. And that was sort of my first experience with daily journalism and covering all kinds of bizarre stories uh, because it was such a bizarre place. So I worked there for a year and then went to... Uh, uh, you know, a succession of other papers in California and then Minnesota. And, you know, you mentioned interviewing earlier and you're kind of building the toolbox right. of the skills that it takes to be a reporter. Um, you know, interviewing is always one, like probably, you know, my favorite part of the process, right. even though I have a little anxiety around it sometimes. Um, but I wonder with you, like, what what did you really latch on to as, as, as the thing that you, um, you, you felt best at that you were the most sort of alive for, if that makes any sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, I from the beginning, I actually knew that I wanted to write books, and I thought, well, th this journalism stuff—it's it's valuable experience. This is what people do. This is like what Hemingway did. You know, I mean, back in the old days, this is just what one did to sort of cut their teeth. Uh, but <laughs> when I wrote these letters that I was telling you about, you know, to all these newspapers, you know, dear managing editor, I am twenty-two year old, so the, you know, I want to come work for a newspaper. And I, I distinctly remember in a lot of these letters saying, oh, by the way, uh, someday I'm going to write books. And I'm sure that, you know, that somewhat a managing editor, you know, was like, yeah, right, kid. You know, or what do I care what you're going to do in 30 years? Or, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're going to write the great American novel, too, or whatever. But I remember, like, putting this line in there in all these letters. Uh, so I guess at that point, it was important enough to me to uh, to sort of articulate that as part of, like, my my manifesto, my mission statement, you know, to all these potential employers. Uh, I saw it as a training ground to write books eventually. And then, um, and then what, well, why write books or why do journalism? It was just a way, a way to be curious. It was licensed to be curious about the world and to create something of value. Um, I mean, that's the simplest way I can put it. It's just, yeah, license to be curious and license to create. And how do you go about curating your story ideas and vet out the kind of stories that really appeal to your taste so you can dive in with all your rigor and curiosity, as you say? Yeah, well, I don't know if I have a good system. I mean, if, if I had a good system, this book would not have taken as long, you know, 10 years, you know, it would have been. So, uh, you know, I, I've, you know, I've had a, I've done a few interviews with like science, uh, you know, podcasts or writing podcasts like, like yours, but you know, the, 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 the one category of things that are conspicuously absent and will always be conspicuously absent are time management <laughs> guru websites. You know, I will never be on like the getting things done or the time efficiency or the you know, seven habits of effective right. people, you know, podcast. Uh, so for me, it's a lot about trial and error. It's what seems interesting to me. I, I never look at a problem and, and think, oh, what will sell? Or, or gee, what, how do I capture whatever trend is, you know, afoot in the world? For me, it's always uh, what's interesting to me. And um, I am, 
I mean, just pathetically out of sync with like uh, pop culture. I mean, my kids make fun of me because <laughs> I'll say, you know, they'll mention some name and I'll say, who is that? And they say, well, how could you not know that's a character on Game of Thrones or that's, you know, something from Breaking Bad or, or whatever. Um, so I, I am r- really not attuned to like... Uh, trends i just follow my curiosity and and think oh that looks interesting i wonder how that works i wonder how that came to be i wonder how uh what are the stories behind this stuff i mean science i think scientists have the same curiosity i mean they they can find great fascination just by examining things in great detail and uh you know, things that might look sort of arcane or, 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 or just like numbingly or tedious to a lay person. If you have a body of knowledge and you can, uh, you know, that, that minutia is endlessly fascinating. And yeah, and there's something I love, of, and this is definitely uh, akin to what scientists are about, especially when they drill down on a certain discipline, is that I love that single-minded focus that so, that certain people have, whether that be, you know, paleoanthropology or right. you know, ballerinas or bodybuilders or whoever yeah. it is. I I, I right. love those kind of people, and they they are endlessly fascinating to me of just the the degree yeah. of focus they have. Yeah, yeah, and and uh, I, I I totally agree, and I also. Um, I'm drawn to people who would do what they do, whether or not anyone is watching. I mean, if they get a claim, yeah, that's nice. But, you know, people who are really drawn to what they who really feel a passion would do it uh, in complete anonymity. Uh, and uh, I, don't know, I, I kind of admire that, that sort of integrity, that sort of single-minded focus where those people are, are focused on... Um, not the not the recognition, not the acclaim, not the any of those things, but just the sheer joy of discovery. Yeah, like the work itself is its own reward. Yeah, yeah. As a yeah, as a as a reporter and a writer, what are what are some things that you identify, Kermit, that maybe you kind of struggle with? Yeah, well, okay. So I've only written one book. So this is, uh, you know, my sample is, you know, and equals one. So it's a pretty, uh, <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe after I've written more books, I'll have a, a better answer. But for me, the, the the big challenge in this, with this book, and was the synthesis of all the material into a narrative. So I got into this, and 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 by the way, I had no idea. As I said in the acknowledgments, I had no idea what I was getting into. I just thought, well, this here is old skeleton. I mean, this is kind of interesting. Uh, it, you know, I actually started off writing, intending to write a different book. And this thing, you know, this Artie story just sort of welled up underneath me and sort of became increasingly hard to ignore. And then to the point where I abandoned, you know, my initial topic and said, no, this, this Artie story is much more interesting uh, because it has... You know, the characters and all this interesting anatomy and all this interesting backstory and et cetera, et cetera. Without derailing you too much, uh, what was the original book that got derailed by the Artie narrative? Yeah. Uh, so I, I set out to write a – it was it was anthropology. I set out to write sort of the, 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 the deep history of, of human endurance or the deep history of like uh, where – humans got this unusual ability to run and walk long distances. And, you know, because we are kind of unusual among primates. We're slow and we're weak and all that stuff. But you know, but we have this sort of prodigious ability, at least compared to our cousin apes, to, to do things like run marathons, you know. And so I was just curious where that came from. I, you know, I was a runner and skier and cross-country skier. So I just thought, okay, this is kind of like the deep, the natural history of human endurance. Where did this come from? And uh, so that's what I intended to work on, thinking that, you know, this Artie Lucy stuff would be you know, just a little background material and that it just kept mushrooming and mushrooming. It's, oh, it's more, it's, it's goes from a page to five pages. Oh, gee, and okay, maybe it's a whole chapter. Oh, no, it's a couple chapters. And then finally it was like, no, no, this is actually much more interesting than the book I was starting off uh, to do. But to get back to your earlier question about uh, what was the, the hard part, to, to me, 
I, I was fine finding all these interesting topics within this story. I mean, some of them were natural history of the human body, which is, you know, my original interest. And with Artie, you know, because the skeleton was so complete, it was the, the natural history of all these different body parts, the hand, the foot, the skull. And, I mean, this, you know, stuff is endlessly fascinating to me. But then there was all this other interesting stuff, like the backstories of the characters, the history of Ethiopia, you know, sort of in turmoil during this whole uh, search for the skeleton and then the interpretation of the skeleton. You know, the trials that like a generation of these, uh, this first generation of Ethiopian scientists had gone through, the dynamics of scientific communities, you know, the rivalries, the, 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 the paradigms, you know, different schools of thought, uh, who are either competing or just fundamentally unable to communicate with each other. You know, uh, you know, this gets into the whole history of science and the philosophy of science sort of thing. So anyway, there are all these silos here and that I would go down and I found you know, all the minutia and the history and you know, endlessly fascinating. But at a certain point, I had to come up out of the silo and communicate to the reader who's totally uninitiated in all this stuff. So... You know, that 10-page memo that I wrote, uh, the 10-page backgrounder on radiometric dating is just not going to, you know, it's it's not going to work in this book. It's going to leave the reader glazed-eyed or, you know, 10 pages on developmental biology or all these things. So I, I had to figure out how to take all the stuff that I found so fascinating but um, lighten it up and sprinkle it throughout a narrative about humans on this quest so that to me that was the hard part it was it was how to um, learn all this stuff you know where I could communicate to, you know uh, where I could have conversations with the scientists the specialists who were doing it but then kind of uh, step away from that uh, level of engagement and summarize it for the lay reader, and so that that was the hard part of this whole book. And and if you know that was ninety percent of the the trials was figuring out how to do that. I love the moment in in the book too, where uh, Owen Lovejoy is just uh, I forget exactly what he's referring to when he's writing about. It's about a a lot of the pelvic bones of various primates and uh, or homin in homonyms too. Uh, he wrote, like, I sat down to write the first chapter and lost my mind. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's very Owen, by the way. But yeah, he, he, uh... yeah, that, could, yeah. that just got me thinking about the scope of his work, the scope of the discipline, and of course, the scope of you trying to write this book as well. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, he, he had the same, well, I mean, he had a similar problem where uh, the science is so complicated, and, and sometimes as you look, at it and try to summarize the story. In the act of summarizing it, trying to capture it, you realize, oh, I didn't quite have it right. <laughs> you know, by putting, crystallizing your thought into writing, you know, sometimes the stuff stares you back in the face and basically teaches you something that you hadn't quite articulated to yourself. And uh, that, you know, happened again and again with me. So I, I struggled a lot with that. And, you know, it, some early drafts were kind of a bit too textbooky, hmm. and uh, at one point, I, I there was this great piece in the Atlantic about three years ago, written by um, I think it's Thomas Ricks, yeah, I think it's Thomas Ricks, where he he wrote about writing this book uh, about or- Orwell and Churchill, and his own struggles with it. And he turns it in, and his editor sends it back and says, "You know, this is no good. You have it. You know, you've you've." you failed in this draft. And he writes about the, the, his trials in doing that. But he had one line in there um, that he, where he's quoting what his editor told him, and that was, uh, if you would only defer to the narrative, you could get away with murder. Hmm. And you think what he means by that is like, you can tell us all this other stuff, but you need to, you need to maintain the story, the human story here. And anyway, I wrote that yeah, I, I read this when I was in like the darkest <laughs> night of like mid passage across this ocean where I couldn't see either shore, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I wrote that on a post-it and stuck it right above my desk, and it's still there. Three years later, I'm looking at it right now, 
if you'd only defer to the narrative, you could get away with murder. That's incredible. So that, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, you. That metaphor that you say about you know not being able to see either shore. Like I've, I love asking people, you know, some you know once you get into the ugly middle of these things, you know, it's too far to turn back, and you're not you can't quite see right. the lighthouse, you know, on the right. shore where you need to go. It's like how do you get yourself how do you get yourself through? And it sounds like you, you that cracked the code for you, you know, just deferring to the narrative. Yeah, deferring to the narrative. But I also, for me, a hard part was unlearning, in a sense, what I knew. I mean, you, you need to keep the information because that's you know, all your reporting and that's what you know, gives a book value. But you have to learn as much as you can, but then imagine the reader who knows nothing. And so to me, like writing a reporting and writing these books, it's, it, it's, it's basically... If I had to summarize it, I'd say it, 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 I'd say as follows: It's it's learn as much about your topic as you possibly can. Learn every, read everything, talk to everyone, and then when it comes time to write it, figure out what ninety eight percent of it you're going to leave out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that is hard because uh, you don't. Um, to me, and I think this is probably true of anyone who immerses themselves in a topic. Uh, it's all interesting. And so in a way you become sort of numb to what a lay person would find interesting, you know? And uh, so you have to uh, sort of inhabit the mind of, of, you have to accumulate all this knowledge, but then try to step outside yourself and imagine the mind of someone who is like the old you, the someone who knows nothing. And what, what, what about all this stuff that you found would that person find interesting? What 2% of this you know, huge body of knowledge that you have is the part that's worth telling that curious but un, uninformed person? What killed you to leave out of this book? Uh, <laughs> yeah, let's see. Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, there were well, there's some things that uh, that I would love to have put in, but I just couldn't find the sources. You know, like you know, an episode, or you know, there was maybe like a body of papers that were closed off. You know, that never like an archive that was never opened up. You know, in some cases I pass over. There's there's no one thing, but in a lot of cases I pass over something really lightly. You know, or else it just like touch on the natural history of the spine or the foot. And I would think, oh, you know, if I could only just tell you all this other interesting stuff I learned, oh boy, you know, that was like, I put so much time into doing that. And gee, wouldn't it be great just to keep you here for 10 pages to tell you all about, you know, you know, radiometric dating or whatever. But, uh, you know, some of that stuff kind of killed me to leave out. But I think in the end, it was, uh, it was merciful on the reader that, that I that we did. Yeah, I never thought I'd be so enraptured by like os peron, peron, uh, peronium sesamoid. <laughs> os peronium, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I was like, this is that was incredible. Like this, the, just trying to put myself in the heads of the scientists and looking at the bones and the fact that this this one particular tendon in the foot usually threads through this bone and then in. I guess in more, I guess for lack of a better term, advanced hominins, it, it goes over the bone or something. Am I getting that right? Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, I mean, this this is like um, this this is very much this is very much seeing this through Owen Lovejoy's eyes. But o- Owen is a guy who thinks very deeply about anatomy, and and uh, and you know that's one little detail, and you could say it's a trivial detail, but. You know, to Owen, that little trivial detail was uh, indicative of a larger design of the animal. So that's why he found it was a, a significant detail. But yeah, in that case, it's it's a little sesamoid, which is a, a, a little bone that's embedded within a tendon. I mean, like your kneecap is a sesamoid. That's the big one in the body. Most of them are like these things that are the size of peas or lentils. And there's one on the side of the foot called the osperonium, which Owen kind of latched onto because... Uh, Artie apparently had this little feature, and uh, as do humans, but 
the modern species of African apes, you know, chimps and gorillas did not, and can't look at a diagram or, or see it. But anyway, he, he inferred a lot from that. Uh, but, you know, that, I mean, so that was just a, a good example of, of kind of going down a, a silo. The natural history of the foot is just endlessly fascinating. And the foot, you know, we don't talk about it much because it's kind of like the lowly foot, right? I mean, people would much rather talk about, you know, the, the human brain or the hand because they're to sort of capture our imagination more. But the, the foot is actually as distinctly human as the brain or and it's this weird contraption that doesn't exist anywhere else in the animal kingdom. So, yeah, Artie was an opportunity to talk about the foot and how naturalists, you know, anatomists have tried to understand it over over the generations. And uh, that little story about the, the sesamoid just became a uh, um, a little anecdote, a little micro revelation with Artie that I could build that the story of the foot around. Yeah, and you're right too that uh, paleoanthropology is the aggregation of broken remains to compose a mosaic of the past. Yeah. And, and and in your reporting and embedding yourself with these scientists, like what impressed you most about the way they were able to be so deductive with with almost like limited evidence, but to them, I guess it's a lot of evidence, but to us, it's like, how are they piecing together this history? Yeah. So, so what I was trying to do with this book was, uh, uh, exp- show this science at work from the ground up, you know, from when, I mean, literally boots on the ground when these guys are in a fossil field walking and, you know, how they find things, how they excavate things and then, you know, clean them, interpret it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you could look at this book as sort of like following the life cycle of a major discovery you know, from search to discovery to reconstruction to interpretation and then, you know, the big really fractious debate that followed. Um, so, yeah, to me it was just the simplest way to do that was just to tell a story from beginning to like when the search begins, what are they searching for, why? And then how do they find it? And then how do they then find their the truths? How do they find the data, the science, you know, these broken remains? And how do they turn that into into to knowledge? Um, so, and, and how do they do that? Well, you know, people who study this, well, just, just as one example of, of um, uh, like say you find a little tooth or a bone, you know, the, the, uh, I mean, humans and apes, in African apes like chimps or gorillas. I mean, we're certainly different, but on the other hand, there's like certain designs that we all <laughs> have that haven't, if you zoom way out, look at the aggregate, it hasn't changed that much. So, you know, if you find a little bone and, you know, that's a foot bone, I mean, they know exactly where to put it in the skeleton. They know exactly, or they have a pretty good idea of how it compares in size to other species or other known examples of, you know, this species or that species. So, you know, because these experts have so much knowledge, they can uh, put, you know, really isolated fragments or in some cases like broken fragments into a context that uh, where, even, you know, even those broken pieces are quite revealing. And that's that is the, the 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 province of the expert, where uh, they can see things because they have so you know this vast storehouse of knowledge that they can look at, let's say, a bone, and say, oh, that is different than anything else we've seen. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, one one example is uh, in the book where Tim White is cleaning this uh, foot bone. Right after he comes out of the field, and they've found, they've found the Artie skeleton, but you know they've just been up to that point worrying about excavating it, just get it out of the out of the ground safely back to the lab, and then then we can interpret it. But he's you know short on time; he's got to catch a plane out of Ethiopia in a few hours, so he cleans this one bone in the foot and discovers that uh, the bare time that he has, you know, just a few hours before leaving, he only has time to uncover a very small portion of this thing, but he uncovers just enough to say, oh, it's got the rounded sort of cylindrical joint that suggests this animal had a grasping toe. 
And that's, so again, he's got uh, this so much contextual knowledge that little details can actually speak volumes. And, you know, I studied biology in college uh, and even getting into uh, some evolutionary biology, the, the notion of the common ancestor was always something that even kind of confused me back then because you had a, right. the trees themselves kind of feel like, oh, there's this, there is this one little common ancestor and then it branches right. off and it's, of right. course, extinct. It's left behind. But it's always that was always some a uh, bit of a foggy picture for me, and I you know, and this book kind of clarifies that up. And that the evolutionary bases of various trees are more like bushes instead of branches. I wonder if maybe you can explain that, maybe how you got your head around it. Yeah, well, there's a couple things to to say about that. Um, uh, one is that whether you prescribe to an idea of a bush or a tree, both those are very imperfect metaphors that I think no matter what plant metaphor you pick, that metaphor maybe oversimplifies the biology a little bit, which I'll, which I'll explain uh, in a second. You know, the, the tree, in you know, throughout this whole book, um, illuminating the family tree was kind of like the quest. And of course, they want to, you know, get back to the split point of humans and chimpanzees. You know, one of the tricky things about writing this book is that their notion of like when that split occurred uh, changed. So in a sense, the, the, the ground of science was kind of shifting underneath them. Because when this, when this story start, uh, began, you know, people were thinking like the last common ancestor, you know, the, the so-called LCA of chimps and humans lived maybe like five million years ago, six million years ago. And when these guys were searching for, you know, what, Later became Artipithecus. They're in you know, like four and a half billion years, so they're you know, they have reason to think they're getting pretty close to that split. Well, over the course of this book, you see that molecular biology, it's it, as it, it as it is advancing. You know, they're kind of revising the split times, and the split goes deeper into the past. Number one, and then by uh, molecular biology is revealing that splits are not these decisive moments in time where like one species says, okay. You know, uh, chimp, we're the humans, we're going this way, you guys are going that way, bye. And there's like ha- something that happens in a one generation with a decisive split. I mean, what really happens, you have all these populations and some kind of drift away, you know, and isolate and maybe evolve, you know, you know so these biological distinctions, but then they come back in contact. So you have these populations that are kind of drifting apart. But then sometimes like remixing. So this, this, this split can be a really slow and protracted process, um, which makes it really hard to identify a, a, a precise split time or a precise last common ancestor. I mean, this stuff is, is still fairly uh, controversial, so not everyone agrees with that. But, but I think there's a growing awareness that Splitting is a messy and protracted process. Uh, so that's that's number one. Um, and then the second thing is this whole idea of a family tree. If you look at a tree diagram, you know the the branches in the in uh, the splits, like between humans and chimps, for example, it's always depicted, at least in the traditional tree, as a a, a clear separation at, at a certain point in time, but you know, because of the dynamics I was describing a minute ago, where you have things splitting and then remixing, you know, those branches sometimes come together, which is unlike any tree or bush. And so now a lot of people in science are looking at other metaphors, like um, maybe it's like a lattice or a mesh as opposed to a tree. I mean, eventually when the things become so different that they, you know, that they, they decisively split, like, you know, as humans and chips eventually did, then you know the tree diagram holds, but during the early the, the, you know the early time of that splitting, it's it's much messier than that, and so the tree or bush, I think sometimes that metaphor makes people, yeah, maybe oversimplify the nature of, of speciation. Yeah, I, I love the. I, I I don't know if this was you quoting someone or you wrote this, but it was like mixtures all the way down, which was kind of. 
it, it, it kind of it's like a slurry for a while, for millions of years, maybe. And then yeah. eventually, you know, there are going to be dominant populations that have distinct morphological properties that allow them to possibly out survive some of the yeah. some of that mixture. And then that's where we see the big divergence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it, it's it's endlessly interesting endlessly fascinating but um yeah way, way more complicated than you know every species either led directly to us or was a dead end which is you know i think sometimes how people have interpreted the family tree in the past and so so this this sort of dogmatic adherence to a simple tree diagram i think made uh some people make false choices like so you find two species they look different so they say, oh, well, which one is the ancestor of humans and which one is a dead end? Well, you know, both could have, you know, theoretically be ancestors to, to modern humans, but they just diverge. They're different populations or neither one. I mean, we don't, in most cases, you'll, you might never know. But, uh, yeah, so I think that the tree maybe this sort of too rigid uh, adherence to this tree model maybe made people a little more didactic than they really should be. Yeah. So anyway, that, that, that was another thing that, that um, was tricky about this book, is that like the whole notion of the tree, which has been sort of this, the, this central metaphor of evolutionary biology, you know, since, you know, for hundreds of years now, um, that we, we need to look at that tree a little differently than we did back in the old days. And speaking of, uh, you know, dogmatic adherence, you know, one of your central figures uh, <laughs> being Tim White, who is just a larger than life personality in this book. Um, you know, talk a little bit about him and what it was like to shadow him, report on him and maybe not be subsumed by the, uh, <laughs> the personality of Tim White. Yeah. So, so Tim is, yeah, obviously he's a, a central figure in, in this book. Tim, uh, I mean, he, he was, uh, I mean, as you probably know, he, he is, he's a strong figure. He could be kind of volatile sometimes, but... And a purist. He, yeah, he, and a purist. Uh, and he has, you know, very strong views about the right or wrong way to do things and what's, you know, ethically right. And, and you know, very defensive of his scientific mission. He, you know, you know being, uh, as I was, being so interested in anatomy or all these different aspects of the science. I mean, you could ask, you could not ask for a better person just to sit down beside and talk about these things because this guy lives his science so deeply. Uh, like, you know, for example, he wrote a book called Human Osteology that's been through several editions, and it's, you know, a book, a textbook about the skeleton. Um, he's written other books about, you know, cannibalism or post-mutum, a post-mortem mutilation, um, He's a guy who has this kind of like 360 degree immersion in all the aspects of his science. And, th- and there's a lot of aspects of the science. I mean, it's anatomy, it's geology, it's, it's local relations with the, you know, the Afar clans and the place that you're working in, on, 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 like that. Tim is kind of at the hub of it all and sort of tirelessly, <laughs> you know, uh, do what, do what, how should we put it? Doing, uh, you know, uh, quality assurance. <laughs> you know, um, but he, he, you know, typical conversation with Tim is I would just, you know, call him up, or you know, sit down with him, and we'd start talking. And next thing I know, it would be like two or three hours later. <laughs> I mean, the time it would just fly because I'd say, well, "Tell me about when you were cleaning that video cuneiform. What was that like?" What did it look like when it came out of the ground? Uh, what when you were cleaning it? How much could you see? How did you clean it? You know, and and, and you know he's uh, all about the minutia. I mean, again, it's you know the people who are uh, like him who have this fascination with this stuff. They 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 you know this is their the bread and butter of their science. You know, to talk about the grain by grain, clean, you know cleaning of this stuff you take it off the, you know each little bit of matrix or this or that so um, yeah so I engage them a lot at that level we haven't mentioned this but uh, at a certain point after I've been talking to Tim for a while he let me look at his uh, video archive because you know being a relentless 
documentarian. He has photographs of everything uh, and notes, field notes on everything. And during the excavation of Artie, they set up this video camera on a tripod and pointed it at the excavation area and then just kept it rolling all day. And, you know, they did this for documentation uh, of the find. But when I looked at it, this was like gold to me because... I could hear the dialogue when they're mm. finding things. I could see what people were doing. You know, I could hear Tim muttering to himself or hear his assistant saying, the whole thing is there. Um, it, uh, if you had been there, it's a very slow drama because you know, the excavation just goes on for days and weeks. Uh, and and you know, all this stuff would have been forgotten. No one would have bothered to write down, you know, so-and-so said the whole thing is there or Tim saying, you know, you can't take shortcuts at this site. But I could hear that. I could see it. And, and uh, that allowed me to basically present a, uh, you know, a, 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 a account of this scene as if I had been standing there the whole time. There's a, a moment, too, where you quote Owen Lovejoy and it made me think uh, of Tim and he's pretty, you know, rigid and, and certainly abrasive in the, in the community and uh, in a bit of a lightning rod. Uh, but, you know, Lovejoy said that science progresses with the death of each faculty member. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that just struck me as like, I bet there are a lot of people who are just kind of waiting out Tim so they can kind of advance, <laughs> you know, their their narrative or their put their spin on this history that's been so dominated by Tim and his colleagues for decades. Yeah, but when Tim goes, yeah, people might realize how much they miss the people that actually go and find this stuff. Because, uh, you know, one one thing that struck me about this science, I mean, there's no doubt Tim is a, you know, he's a polarizing figure. And there's people who will follow Tim to the end of the earth and have, <laughs> you know, followed him there because he's so... Uh, devoted to the mission and, and good at what he does. But, you know, there's a large number of people that just find him to be, you know, abrasive or he hurt their feelings once or, or they find him to be, you know, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, this, the qualities that make him abrasive also made, allowed him to excel in an environment where um, it, be, it would have been really easy to fail. And at several points throughout my reporting of the story, I'd sort of step back and I'd, I'd look at all the trials that this team went through. You know, they're getting shot at by the local people more than once. They get their permit taken away by, you know, the Antiquities Administration because they piss off the wrong people or, you know, they lose their funding. They get, they're, they're getting, you know, bad mouthed by professional rivals. There's all these things that happened that could have torpedoed them and sunk this whole operation. But every time, they, they survived. And uh, numerous times, I've just sort of stepped back, stepped back and just said, God, I'm just amazed these guys are still in business because a less determined, less relentless group of people would have just like said, you know what, to hell with it. This is too difficult. It's too hard. It's too dangerous. It's it's too much of a thankless job, uh, I, you know. I'm just going to go dig dinosaurs in Montana or go teach, you know, at my comfortable college job and and live a happy, conflicted life, and that'll be good enough. But you know, these guys didn't do that. These guys felt this drive to go find this stuff and survive one near fatal. I mean, for the team, fatal encounter after another. So. Um, so yeah, th those those things that make t Tim and some of his colleagues controversial are, I think, the same qualities also enabled him to survive in a, an environment where uh, there's no shortage of things that could put you out of business. Mm. And as we kind of uh, bring this airliner down, um, a question I always like to ask people towards the end of these conversations is kind of like this a library for the end of the world or a bookshelf yeah. for the apocalypse and, you know, these yeah. books that you need to keep with right. you in your pack. Well, uh, that, yeah, because, yeah, you're right, you know, it's a good uh, thing to uh, ask a person who 
has been thinking about extinction for the last few years. So yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So the, you know that said, I'd love to hear like what are what are some of these key books for you that you you return to over and over again that you would act you would put in your in your in your pa- in your backpack uh, in place of vital rations. Yeah. So. Um, I don't know. They're not all books that I return to over and over again, but they're things that maybe I was would grab if I had to like jump into the escape pod or or, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, uh, I think I take something like the Norton Anthology of Poetry. Uh, nice. Since we're we're packing light, you know, poetry carries the most meaning per word, and you know, a good poem is so evocative and so mysterious, where you could keep rereading it and recontemplating it and seeing new meeting, you know, to like all the ways of looking at the Wallace Stevens Blackbird or whatever. Um, it just seems like a poem would just let you ponder <laughs> the same text over and over again and get something new out of it. So that's one. Maybe something, you know, by John le Carre for two reasons. One is I just enjoy him as a writer, as a plot, you know, the way he plots his stories and, you know, characters struggling with like the moral ambiguity of the mission and the clash between like the human characters and the geopolitical forces. That's part of that selection. The other one is just pure personal inspiration. I mean, the guy is nearly 90 years old now. And he's still thriving. He's still, you know, in his prime and writing about much younger people and contemporary events. Uh, and so that would inspire me to remain, remain productive into old age, maybe outlast whatever the disaster is that uh, sent me into this mm-hmm. bunker or desert island in the first place. Okay, so that's two. Number three, uh, Charles Dickens' Complete Works. Mm-hmm. And uh, to be honest, I haven't read much Dickens, and I feel guilty about it. So this is more of a can't you know something to catch up on since I'm going to be isolated here. <laughs> it, it, it's it's it, the Complete Works is fifteen volumes. Is that cheating? You know, for nah. the five volumes. No, that's oh, good. Okay. You, you, know, you found the loophole. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then th- this, this, the next one, uh, I feel a little sheepish saying this. Uh, I take a long copy of Fossil Man, my book, and it, it may sound like self-promotion, but actually it's just the opposite. It's an opportunity for self-criticism. It's like, with the advantage of hindsight, and I read it again, and say, oh, yeah, I could have deleted that scene or done this differently or that differently. Self-flagellate yourself into the apocalypse. Self-flagellation, yeah. Yeah, but also it's it's sort of like, you know, every, uh, every what you read as a, a line or a word to me is like, it's like the remembrance of things past where you take a little bite of something and it just like brings back all this memory. And so to me, it's, it's almost like a, an album. But mostly it's... Uh, uh, an album of memories, but mostly I, I take that just to, um, yeah, figure out how I can do it better next time. Uh, so that's four. I got one more. I, I guess the last one will be a blank journal. Nice. Uh, just filling it up would keep me busy. I'd have to, I'd have something. I have to process the experience and synthesize whatever I'd <laughs> been reading in all those other books. And uh, at, for your post-apocalyptic memoir, <laughs> yeah, and then and if it really is the end of the world, it's it's you know that's important history, and someone has to document it. So, I volunteer. I love it. Oh, that's so. great. Well, uh, Kermit, it was great talking to you. Uh, congrats on the book. It's an incredible book, and uh, and a, an incredible testament to the work as you you put in as a writer and reporter. So I commend you on the work, and thank you for the work, and thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, it's it's my pleasure, and and uh, I really love this podcast, and I've learned so much from listening to the other people you've had on. So I'm I'm uh, just flattered to be among them. So thank you very much. Hey you, yeah hey you, don't don't stop yet. Uh, thanks for listening. I, I gotta say, it doesn't get old. This thing we do, right? It doesn't get old. Gotta say thanks to Kermit for the time. He had great things to say about the podcast at large. You know, after we were you know done recording, and I, I'm grateful for those kind words. It kind of validates the enterprise, puts a little fuel in the tank because you know we run on fumes sometimes here and. Uh, Nice. Thank you. Kind words go a long way. So consider leaving written review in Apple Podcasts or emailing me a review. 
that I can read on air and use for that promotional material for when I court sponsors and the like. Also, being you know, don't don't forget I, I I do if you're like out of shape and you you know, you feel like you feel like garbage and you want someone to hold you accountable you, you hire a trainer right same thing for your writing if you're ready to level up give me a call and we'll have a dialogue and we'll see if there's if I can help you get where you want to go all right we'll think about that think of a stew on that so today was a today was a day man it was a day. I can barely breathe because I ran some hills, you know, sprinted some hills. I ran them with Hank, the the dog, and uh, it's because of Hank that I'm particularly gassed, and like where my windpipe is all raspy and where I just uh, it hurts, it burns, baby. And uh, he was just fast enough going up the hills that I could keep pace with him up the hill, but then I realized I was running way faster up these hills than I normally would because he was pacing me like a damn rabbit around a greyhound track. I almost threw up like 40 times, and we only did six hills, so that's like eight bars. Is that even the right math? Does six go into 40? I don't think it does. I think it goes like 6.8 into 40, but whatever. It was quite a bit of near barfing, and uh, you got to push that extreme, man. got to get swole. I've been following a lot of these CrossFit athletes, and I got to say, the men and the women, they're just like so damn sexy and ripped, like all of them. Yeah, I, the, the women who are jacked out of their minds, like I don't find it unattractive like a lot of other douchebags out there who might say they're like too masculinely built. I don't think so. I, I just I find it inspiring. And it's uh, and I can say that the dudes are hot, too. Whatever. I can say it. I'm like, I got to push myself to that extreme, you know? Like, I'm not saying do CrossFit or anything. I have my own uh, my own gym I can do. But say what you will about CrossFitters. The, the ones who are the pros and the ones who are like the pros, they're just damn sexy. And I love the devotion. I love the devotion to a craft. And that craft is their athleticism and their, and their, and their bodies. It's uh, just, it's good stuff. I'm inspired by it. I know that when I'm in decent shape, when I'm throwing iron around, I feel a whole lot more confident, stand taller, speak more clearly, comport myself with assuredness. I'm not a naturally confident person, as you know. If you've been around the block, if you've been around the CNF and block, you know that uh, I am my number one rain cloud. I, uh, I, rain, I rain the shit down on me, and uh, I've come to realize that it's... I'm the only one who's really saying all this bullshit. And I don't want to say it anymore. That's why I kind of gave up on the if you can't do interview thing at the end. But in any case, when my skin feels tighter, when my clothes fit better, when I'm throwing up a lot of weight, when I'm running up hills, I do have more confidence and it bleeds into other areas of my life. And I like to think that if I'm a little more confident and a little more generous with my attitude, that it might even help you if you're listening to this at this point. Uh, you might even yeah, I might even sound a bit better, maybe even a little more present than I already am during the show. A bit more, you know, engaged and alive and inspiring, at least in terms of the intention I'm giving to the guest, and maybe that can bleed over to your work. Because you know I make the show for you. I make it for me, but of course, I make it for you. Well... There's a bunch of shit I bet you didn't care to know, but now you do, if you stuck around. All right, here's something you're really going to want to know, though. The audio mag on isolation, the first one from CNF Pod, and a a wing of Exit 3 Media. A little bit on that later. It's finally done. It's finished. Finally. It came out great. I plan on publishing it as soon as I set up the Patreon page for the podcast, something I've dragged my feet on for probably two years. So, um, yeah, get out your wallets. I'm passing the dish, man. The first audio mag is going to be, always be free for all, but the next ones will only go out to patrons. So I'm drawing up my tiers. The Patreon thing will hopefully put a little juice in the treasury so maybe I can pay writers, uh, even just a small stipend if they're accepted. You know, why not? You know, we believe in that. 
and uh, also just to subsidize this operation a bit, you know, while offering you some really cool shit. Coaching, editing, shout outs, links to your websites, ad free content. Most of it is, you know, by and large ad free, but sometimes I have sponsors and I, I think I might land some more in the future. So you might want to be ad free so you can get more of this, right, man? The show will always be free, but it sure as hell ain't cheap. I can tell you that off the bat. So, I, you know what? That's going to be it for this week. So do me this favor. Stay cool, CNFers. Stay cool forever. See ya.